Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm hot. Um, good. So uh, my name's Mark Allen. I'm going to talk to you about ETS today and a lot, a lot of other things as well, I hope. Um, but uh, thanks for coming to the talk. I know that uh, all of you are going to be in food coma pretty soon, so uh, try to stay awake. Uh, there's coffee in the hall if you need it. Um, but uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about when ETS is too slow. Um, I don't know, I feel like my mic's really hot. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, see if that helps. Does this help? I think that's better. I don't know. Um, so I'm going to talk about when ETS is too slow. And um, I, I just wanted to preview this with a warning. Um, I just want to tell you, I didn't choose the yak shaving life. The yak shaving life chose me. So this talk is about shaving a lot of yaks. It's uh, full of razors. It's full of uh, blood. It's full of um, sharp, pointy things that will stab you. Um, so just be prepared. Uh, there is you know, violence that's going to be committed against Code and Erlang. Um, you know, children avert your eyes. That's all I'm going to say. All right, so um, what even is too slow? Like, people say, that's slow. What does that mean? Um, slow, in this case, has a really interesting meaning, a specific meaning. Um, about six months ago, somewhat randomly, we were working on a project to speed up React's put path. Um, if you didn't already know, uh, React has a, a, a finite state machine that all of the puts run through. Uh, that finite state machine has a bunch of different states in it, as one might you know, assume. Um, and what we discovered was that if we artificially disabled capability lookup, that we got a 10% performance improvement without doing any other work. So just turning off capabilities gave us 10% extra put capability, uh, throughput, operations per second, um, you know, storing bits to disk, all that stuff. Um, capabilities are a part of React that essentially allow uh, v nodes to negotiate with other v nodes, um, whether locally uh, on the same machine or across a cluster, to identify uh, what features they support, what sort of encodings they support, um, those sorts of things. So they're really important to correct application function. They're not a feature that we can just arbitrarily turn off and go on our merry way, right? They have to be part of our application. Um, but the question that we had was why does turning off capabilities? impact us so much. Like, that's a pretty significant performance improvement. Um, so uh, we, uh, we use ETS to back that stuff. And we have caches for ETS data all over React. Um, some other areas where ETS is used is um, for bucket properties. So in React, you can define a user-defined bucket. It can have certain properties associated with it, like how many replicas of data that you want to store. and um, all sorts of different n tunable knobs, like if you want to use CRDTs and like um, whether you want the last writer wins to be on, and if you allow siblings and all sorts of other things. So um, that's another area that uses ETS and is all over our application and also is subject to this, this um, performance impact. And of course, the other area that most people are familiar with is the ring state. <clears throat> um, I don't actually have a slide of the ring, so if you came to the talk and expected to see that, you will be sadly disappointed today. Um, there are lots of other talks that I've done that have that slide in it, so if, you, if you'd like, just go look me up on YouTube. Uh, you can watch one of them. Um, so uh, just, just as a quick summary, uh, the ring state is really the, the global node state of all the members of a React cluster. So it includes things like um, who is joining, who's leaving, who's up, who's down. Um, you know, all those sorts of uh, application management state things are part of the ring state. Um, also, the ring contains some other metadata um, that's not important, but the, the main thing is, is that it's a very large data structure that it's mostly read-only, and it's also stored in an ETS cache for a while. Um, more on that coming soon. Anyway, um, we developed a hypothesis. The hypothesis, the hypothesis was this. If we could speed up all these cache lookups, then we will see big wins across our entire application. If we get 10% just by arbitrarily turning off capabilities, what if we could you know, improve the performance of cache lookups even by like 10% or 15% or 20%, um, that would be an enormous impact as you look at you know, hundreds of thousands of operations going across a cluster um, you know, per minute or per second or whatever the scale is. Um, so we had this idea, so we want to take a dirty hack um, that we use for ring state 
and see if we could generalize it and use that technique to speed up our cache lookups for X in other parts of React. So this talk is really about exploring that hypothesis and answering whether or not our intuition about that was true or false. Um, so I, quick, I want to do a quick review. Uh, I assume most of you are familiar with ETS. Is there anyone that is not familiar with ETS? No? All right, I'm going to skip this slide because I have plenty to talk about. Um, but the main thing is, is that it's term storage, it's arbitrary, it uses tuples. Um, that's probably enough for now. The technique that we use, the dirty hack that I wanted to talk about, um, is this thing called uh, Mochi Global. And Mochi Global is still part of React Core right now. Um, there was an adaptation that was added to React Core in the sort of 1.4.2.0 time frame. And the basic idea is that for some period of time, some number of seconds that's tunable, we're going to take writes onto an ETS table. And those writes are going to represent all of the nodes uh, updating ring state across the entire node. And then once that quiesces, we're going to promote that into this dynamically created module. At the bottom of the slide, I have uh, some of what that module might look like. Um, in this case, you know, it's some random thing is the name of the module. There's exactly one function. It's zero ARD. And what's inside of the body of that is some arbitrary data structure. In this case, it's a record called arbitrary. Um, and as you can see, it has five fields. Um, in the case of the ring, um, it's basically the same thing, except instead of having a record there, it's this ginormous, huge GB tree data structure um, that has, you know, a lot of metadata about the entire ring structure. And um, so uh, there's two things that we did to speed that up. One is, is that we build this dynamic module, which is a dirty hack. The other is that we take the entire thing and convert it into a binary and do a bunch of binary operations on it, um, which is also another dirty hack, um, but one that we're not going to copy today. Um, anyway, this is the generalized technique that we wanted to build um, into a, a, a prototype to do some experiments with. Um, so as a weekend project, I wrote this library called Fling. Um, Fling is uh, available on GitHub right now uh, if you want to play with it. It's at uh, Basho Labs Fling. Um, and it, it, it implements that hybrid approach that I described. So as a tunable parameter, you take writes um, to an ETS table for some period of time. Um, by default, it's five ticks of five seconds, so 25 seconds. And after the timer expires, if there has been no writes in that time period, then the module will take the entire contents of the ETS table and build a dynamic module loaded into the runtime system. Um, at that point, the Fling library uh, will read all of its data from that, from that runtime module. And um, if we take new writes, those go to the ETS table, and the gen server that's in front of the ETS table will actually flush, it will flush out the, um, it'll flush out the, the, um, the contents of the dynamically created module. Um, so there's this really, really interesting function. ETS has a lot of features that I think um, are either n not well known or have dragons in them. And, um, one of the things that is not especially well known is that you can actually give ETS tables to another process. Um, there's a function called, called ETS giveaway that implements this. And what it does is it, it takes ownership of a process, uh, sorry, a table that's in a process and hands it off to another process. And it comes into there as a message essentially. And after the message is received, that process owns the ETS table um, in the runtime system. So what, what Fling does is um, it essentially spawns a gen server that sits in front of this and um, manages all of that. Now, um, all the reads in Fling circumvent the gen server. Uh, the gen server is never involved in reading because we don't want to have to go through the mailbox for the gen server just to look up values. Um, we know that the cache is static because it's read only anyway. So we don't ever, ever need to worry about synchronization problems there. The data is going to be constant all the time. We're never taking writes on it. Um, by definition, if we take a write, then at that point, we've lost our sort of guarantee um, and we'll have to rebuild our, our dynamic module. Um, so I built this library and the next thing that I built was uh, some drivers to test it. So Basho has written a, a pretty nice benchmarking tool called Basho Bench. Um, there was an earlier talk today from Machine Zone. Um, they have their own MZ Bench, which uh, sounds really interesting. Um, I haven't been able to play with it yet, but, uh, but it sounds very similar. Um, Basho Bench is uh, a tool that anyone could use to benchmark arbitrary Erlang code if they want. Um, 
and uh, it's concurrent like a boss, compiles to an e-script. It's really nice. Um, it has lots of built-in generators, and uh, you can make user-defined generators, and uh, there are a lot of drivers. Um, I actually have a really simple driver right here. I uh, just want to walk through it really quickly because I, I want to show you how easy it is for you to you know, build benchmarking for your own app. Um, literally, you just basically write two functions. There's a new that kind of sets up your test environment. Um, in this case, it takes one parameter. That is an ID. Um, every Basho bench worker has a, has a numerical integer ID. Uh, starts with one and ends with whatever concurrent value you pick. Um, and then you have to define what to do when you run. So that's a, uh, a ARD4, and it takes some operation name, which is an atom, and then a key gen and a value gen. Those are usually defined in your config file, and the state. And the state's defined up here in your new. So um, once you've invoked your, your environment, set up your state, state gets passed through all the functions, and you can return modified state and all that. You know, pretty typical OTP-style uh, build application. Um, in any case, uh, I built a driver for Fling, and um, uh, started benchmarking it. And this is kind of what we expected to see. Um, the things we were expecting to see was uh, better lookup speed. So we were expecting less latency, um, not only in the amount of uh, gets per second, but also with tail latency. So um, sort of at the extreme end, if we could lower or uh, cap tail latency versus X, then those would also be wins. Um, one of the really interesting things that I've, I've um, learned uh, from, from going to different talks and conferences and just experimenting is uh, if you can cap tail latency in your, in your application um, over time, then that's a really a big win over time because uh, tail latency, those sort of Martian things that take a really long time um, are things that will end up killing your performance in the long run. Um, I mean, you, you, you want low medians to start with, but, um, you know, or, uh, low means, sorry, uh, but, you know, you're really looking for uh, tail latency that's capped at some maximum value that's not too crazy. All right, um, so this is what we expected to see. Spoiler alert, your intuition is usually wrong. This is what we actually saw, okay? Oh, my graph's cut off, lovely. Um, well, so, um, uh, so, you know, play along with me at home here. Um, what this graph actually shows is there's two lines. There's a purple line and a green line. You can see it better over on the, the, um, the one over on the right. Um, the one on the right is actually showing you the maximum latency for the entire operation. So um, the way that these benchmarks were run, um, just, just to describe that, and um, if you go to a talk and the people at the talk don't describe how they built and tested their environment, you should maybe take those results with a grain of salt. So I want to do that right now. Um, the, the benchmarks were all run on this workstation that I'm giving this talk on right now. And um, I also uh, compiled Erlang um, from source, and um, I use a tool called Erlbrew that I wrote. That actually built all the binaries. It's for OS X uh, on El Capitan. Um, and this is a PowerBook, and uh, you know, it's a pretty standard PowerBook. Um, I guess they're called MacBook Pros now. Um, but uh, anyway, um, what we saw was that uh, in almost all cases, uh, Fling performed worse than ETS. Um, and in almost all cases, Fling was more latent at the tail than ETS. And um, that was very surprising to, to all of us. Um, and we didn't understand what was going on. Um, so uh, one of the things that we theorized was that um, the way that Fling works is that when you give it a list of Erlang terms um, that come from ETS, it just iterates over that list, and it puts them all into a function. Um, and the, the parameter of the function, so the, the pattern match that it does, is actually the key value. And the body of the function, um, if I could go back to that Mochi Global, Mochi Global um, slide for a second here. So instead of having an ARD0 term here, we have an ARD1 term, and the ARD1 term is actually the key, and then the value of whatever that is actually goes in the body of the function. Um, and that happens as a linear lookup. So when the Erlang runtime system starts evaluating what function head it should follow, it just starts at the top of the list, and it goes all the way to the bottom. Well, the problem is, is that if you have a lot of terms, and in this case, we were benchmarking about 10,000. Uh, so we created a, a module that had 10,000 function heads with 10,000 values. Um, as we did worst case lookups, um, we found that, the, that um, if you fetched values from the very you know, tail of that list, uh, the bottom of the module, those lookup times were significantly worse than ETS because ETS is you know, constant time lookup and it has all kinds of other advantages like being in C and all sorts of other things um, that are lovely. Um, but in any case, what we found is, is that uh, this technique did not work especially well for the benchmark that we were, that we were testing. 
Um, and uh, so what we decided to do was uh, we started to do some variations on fling. We decided that, yeah, question, Eric. Did you try to native code compile that function? Um, you asked about native code compile. Uh, since I was running this on OS 10, no, I did not do that. Um, I, I, it's, it's one of those things that we, we have, uh, so I'm gonna get into the variations that we're doing now. Um, and, and, and we also have future work uh, that, that we need to do, and that's, that's one of them. Um, but the, thank you for asking. Right. There are, there are some things that will make this better on not OS X. Um, hype is not good for OS X. Um, it causes all kinds of problems. So uh, OS X builds of Erlang typically don't have hype enabled on them because they die. Um, it kills your VM dead. What's the problem with hype on OS X? Um, it, uh, it goes into a memory starvation problem when you're at scale or at, when the system's under stress. And uh, there's, a, there's a certain part of, um, of, the, of the VM that basically gets to a seg fault when it tries to get more memory. Um, that on Linux doesn't cause a seg fault, but on OS X it does. So. And why isn't it reported somewhere? Why hasn't this been reported somewhere? I don't know. I don't know. Um, what, uh, I, I will report it. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so, so, so some of the variations that we decided to try were um, to store our data in a GB tree. Um, so instead of having this linear lookup, we were gonna go back to the single term with zero arity. We're gonna have a really big data structure. Uh, we'll have a GB tree that, you know, then we'll traverse through the GB tree. And uh, theoretically, that would be a better lookup. But it turns out that's even slower than just doing function heads. Um, so we had another idea that was, well, okay, so all the capabilities, all the bucket properties, those are all atoms. Um, so what if we just made the, the key name, the function name, and then they were all zero ARD, and then we could just do a direct lookup through uh, that way. Um, and uh, I have a branch of Fling that implements that, but I'm getting a weird uh, syntax tools problem. So uh, maybe I will track down Ricard <laughs> and sit down with him and figure out why. Um, but it won't compile, at least it won't compile on, on my workstation. Um, so, uh, so anyway, we, we, we decided that GB trees were not going to be a winner. Uh, we decided that, uh, that using uh, keys um, that were atoms right now is something we couldn't test very easily. Um, and then uh, the other things that, you, that have been uh, suggested, like uh, doing JIT and, um, or hype and um, native, compo native code and stuff like that, um, those are all future things that we need to test on a different platform. Um, but, but are good suggestions. So um, we are definitely going to, to look into that. Um, but just continuing on with the story of, of, of what we've been investigating, what specifically what I've been investigating, um, we looked at a couple of, of NIFs, um, a caching libraries that are really interesting. Uh, the first one is called Shirley, um, and uh, it's uh, from the Leo project. Leo project is, a, is an Erlang application that's a, kind of an arbitrary blob store. Um, it was written by uh, Rakuten, um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know what the state of that project is anymore. Um, the, this particular fork of Shirley uh, has been around for a little while. And then the other one that I wanted to talk about today was, um, is uh, one called E2QC. Uh, this is a really interesting library that implements the 2Q cache eviction algorithm uh, that I'll talk about in just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, first of all, I wanted to talk about Shirley. Um, so uh, Cliff Moon wrote this in 2009. Um, it used to use a port driver. It was all implemented in C. Um, but uh, in 2012, uh, some, some developers at Rakuten kind of adopted it. Uh, they um, turned it into a slab allocated off heap NIF. Um, they added rebar because the original version was just straight up Erlang compiler. Um, and they've really cleaned up the code a lot and you know, added more performance enhancements and better memory management and all kinds of other lovely things. Um, so that's the version I tested, and that's the version I would recommend that you use. Um, so what we saw with this was, um, on this slide right here, and again, um, you can kind of see the green line at the bottom. That's just straight Erlang ETS from Basho's OTP distribution. And on top is the purple. The purple is the mean. Uh, so over on, the, over on this side, um, yeah, the right side, uh, this is the mean, and over on the, the uh, left side is the max. Um, and you can see in general that uh, the straight up ETS um, wins on both counts. So there's less latency on the mean, and in general there's less latency at the tail, so at the extreme tail on the max. Um, so 
Uh, you'll notice that they're, they're pretty close, right? Um, if you were to draw a line here, they're pretty close, but there's definitely a separation. Um, so if, uh, if, if, you, if you are in a position where you need to have cash, um, this looks like a pretty interesting option. Um, one thing that straight up ETS does not give you is eviction. So if you need something that has eviction or you need better memory control than what ETS provides, then it seems like this would be a very good library to, to look at um, using in your environment. Um, so the second, the second NIF that we looked at was this one called E2QC. Uh, 2Q is a cache eviction paper um, that came from uh, VLDB uh, in, two, in uh, sorry, 1994, so it's pretty old um, at this point. Um, but it's a really interesting uh, paper. I, I recommend you read it. Uh, it's available at this, uh, this uh, web address, PDF. Uh, it's pretty short, um, but it describes the algorithm. Uh, in short, uh, essentially 2Q offers a, um, a near optimal eviction strategy uh, compared with LRU for certain types of data. And um, in this case, certain types of data are uh, controlled by these two tunable parameters, um, which is essentially the size of the cache slots that you want to offer and how much overall memory you're willing to allocate for the buffers. Um, and the paper goes into great detail about what tunable parameters should be and like what, what, uh, what the performance was versus LRU and um, another um, generalized LRU algorithm called LRU over K. Um, they found that uh, LR, LRU over K in general performs best at LRU over two, um, which means that uh, you don't want to evict until after the second most recent access. Um, the beautifully simple interface. So this, this library is wonderful because it has a great interface. It has a single function call called cache. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, you, you really can't go wrong using it. Um, it, uh, it. It is a lovely interface, very easy to use. Um, so this is the results from that. Um, I don't have a comparison with ETS here because uh, the, the GNU plot um, yak that I was shaving um, didn't allow me to really superimpose them very easily, but you can see that this purple line up here is about 0.1, and if you'll recall from the previous graphs, uh, the Basho ETS um, was around uh, 0 0.5, um, sorry, um, 0 0.05, so it's about halfway up this graph, so it's significantly faster um, in latency, and also over here, um, the latency at the tail is about the same as, as the other NIF interface. Um, well, so we'd already shaved these yaks, and it just kind of made me wonder, well, okay, well, one of the things that, that we've thought about doing is upgrading from OTP 16, which is where we're at right now, to some newer releases. Um, maybe if we, if we could accelerate that, right, if we can accelerate our, mo our move off of six, R16 onto 17 or 18, you know, what's the story there? Uh, what does that look like? Um, so there were a couple of questions that I had about that. One is, um, so we have R16 versus 17 versus 18, and um, then um, one of the things, one of the knobs and dials that, that ETS offers you is this option to use fine grain locking. Um, so they have these options called read concurrency and write concurrency, and you can set those to be true or false. By default, they're off. Um, but uh, my, my question was, well, okay, so on OTP 17, I'm gonna do a run with the locks turn off, right, so by default, sort of the default configuration, and I'm gonna do a run with all of the fine grain locking turned on, and kind of what does that look like, compare, um, con compare and contrast those. So here's our uh, Battle Royale results, um, and in this case, I think it's pretty interesting to see, um, it might be a little hard to see because it's washed out, but there's a purple line uh, at the bottom, that's R16, um, and then there's kind of this big blue line at the top um, that's pretty easy to see. That's R18, or o OTP18. And then all the green stuff that's just sort of going up and down and crazy like that, uh, that's, actually, um, <laughs> that's actually 17 uh, that's, that's doing that. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting uh, to see how um, 16 seems to be the performance winner, at least in this particular benchmark. Um, and then over on the other side there, you can see uh, the latencies. They're pretty comparable. They're almost all exactly the same. In fact, you can see that the peaks and valleys for all of these different OTP releases are basically the same thing. Um, so uh, one of the things that people ask me and other Basho engineers all the time is, well, why does Basho ship their own OTP? Um, this, this graph is why. Um, so on the top, this purple line is actually stock OTP 17 or 16, and on the bottom is Basho's release of OTP 16. Um, with a ton of performance patches that um, were, uh, were developed mostly by WhatsApp, but also some in-house Basho work. Um, we have an engineer named Ted uh, Burkhart who's done a ton of work um, on this particular release, Basho 10, 
to uh, remove as many locks as possible uh, from OTP um, and, uh, and um, replace them with atomic instructions that run on Intel 64-bit chips. Um, so using, uh, using assembly instructions instead of, uh, you know, uh, code inside of the runtime to uh, achieve the same, the same uh, atom atomicity guarantees. Um, and so you can really see the performance improvements there. Um, the top line here is probably about 0 0.01. The bottom line here is 0 0.005. So uh, these are all in milliseconds. Um, it'd be better if the scale was microseconds, but, um, you know, you can imagine basically it's about double of, uh, of what the stock one is. Um, the tail latency is about the same too, so it's uh, pretty interesting. Um, and then this is the one with, uh, with and without locks. Um, so on the bottom, uh, uh, sorry, over on the here on the left, the, um, the green stuff is the ones with fine grain locking, and the ones with purple, that's the one that's just sort of uh, by default. And um, I don't know if you can draw any conclusions from that really. Um, in general, what I see from this is that the green line is a little bit better. It's a little bit better. There's some separation there where the green line is a little bit lower than the purple line. So you see a modest performance improvement by enabling read concurrency true, write concurrency true, um, at least per, for, for this specific benchmark um, and this particular test. Um, all right, so uh, my conclusion was is that X is really hard to beat, <laughs> all right? Uh, why is it really hard to beat? Well, for first, uh, first of all, it's a built-in function. So all of the performance critical parts of ETS are pretty much implemented in C. And uh, things like insert, things like lookup, those are all C calls that under the hood are being handled by the runtime system somewhat transparently to you, the Erlang developer. Um, that's a big reason for the speed. Another reason is, is that in recent times, so from 16, 17, and 18, there's been a lot of work to do better locking, uh, less locking, um, more appropriate locking, fine grain locking if, um, if they're enabled, um, so that X is as performant as it possibly can be. Um, so uh, when I came back to the rest of the team and I was like, you know, uh, this fling thing doesn't seem to be working out super good. Um, you know, maybe we should try to test this in situ. Like, we, we need to figure out how we want to measure performance of, of React, like, in the application itself. So instead of doing these artificial benchmarks, um, that are interesting, right? Um, let's go ahead and, and try to test this um, where React actually runs. And um, what I wanted to do for this was just talk about some tools that we use to do that. Um, I, didn't, I don't have any results to show you today, um, but uh, this is, again, all future work that we need to get done. Um, the first one is this really neat tool called eFlame. It was written by my colleague, Scott Fritchie. Um, it's, uh, he did a talk about it at Erlang Factory last year. It's on YouTube. I highly recommend you watch it. This is a really neat tool uh, that he wrote. Um, I also have a, another tool that came from uh, uh, my colleague, um, former colleague, um, Angel Sanchez. He wrote a, a really neat tool that essentially um, instruments your OTP uh, runtime and then outputs a run graph, and then you can use dot to connect it together. Um, it's a little bit like the one that, uh, that Machine Zone showed this morning, um, but it's uh, a little less... Um, I don't know, a little less overheady, I guess. I'm not really sure how to describe that. Um, it has less steps, at least uh, that I thought it was less steps. Um, I wanted to talk about Dtrace, uh, too, because Dtrace is a really powerful tool. Um, on, uh, on OS X, you get Dtrace out of the box. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I like to, to use uh, OS X as a development platform. Um, and so there's a couple of really good talks about Dtrace and Erlang. The first one is uh, Scott Fritchie's from uh, Dtrace Conf in 2012. That's on YouTube. I uh, highly recommend you watch it. And then a couple years ago, I did a talk at Erlang Factory about using Dtrace in Erlang that defines all of the Dtrace probes and um, kind of how it works. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about was there are a lot of limitations in observability in the Erlang runtime system. And this is something that Scott hits really hard in his presentation, but um, the sort of TLDR of that is that there is a really tiny little straw that's out in your Erlang VM that's sucking up all the performance events and measurements and stuff, and then there's this giant ocean of data that it's trying to suck up. And so what that means is typically the data that you do collect is underestimated. Um, so that the true, the true performance of what you're trying to measure is typically underestimated. Um, and that's just something that you should be wary of. So when you collect benchmarks from Erlang and you use observability tools uh, like eFlame and like some of these other tools, uh, I would just be wary that, you know, you don't put too much faith in them. Um, the way that Scott puts it, and I think this is very wise, 
is that at best, these tools help you rule out root causes. They don't necessarily help you identify them, but they can help you rule out what those things might be. Um, all hope is not lost, right? This is getting better uh, every year. It seems like tracing and debugging and all those tools that we, that we have as programmers are getting better. Um, but right now, uh, as you look at observability um, overall in your runtime, um, there's some asterisks and caveats. You should be wary of, of the results that you get out of the system. Um, so getting the most out of ETS. Um, my advice is to always use read concurrency and write concurrency true, unless you shouldn't. Um, how do you know that? There's really only one way to do that. That's the bottom. You have to benchmark. You have to benchmark. There's no other way around it. Um, you can't go to Hacker News. You can't go to Reddit. You can't go to your buddy. You can't go to YouTube Talks um, and figure out what your problem is. Um, the only way you're going to be able to do that is by testing it and by benchmarking it, by using tools like Basho Bench and just kind of beating on it and using observability tools like eFlame, you know, with an asterisk. And um, uh, the other thing is, is that more recent OTP releases in general are faster um, than, than, uh, than, than older ones. Um, the, the result from, from R16 being faster than R18 really did surprise me. Um, it was honestly a surprise. And I don't know if that's just noise from my personal workstation, right, small sample size or whatever. Um, but in general, uh, what I've found is, is that newer releases of OTP are faster than older releases. And I've seen that time and time again from benchmarking things that aren't sort of artificial, like you know, testing ETS or whatever. Um, when we, uh, when, when uh, John Daly and I refreshed Logger, uh, earlier um, in 2015, we did a lot of benchmarking comparing how our changes impacted the runtime cost of logging um, in the new branch versus the old branch. And what we found is, is that uh, running with OTP 17 versus 16 or OTP 18 versus 16 was is that you would get probably between 5 to 10% impor um, improvement in logger uh, just by switching the runtime system. So it's a pretty significant boost. Um, are there any questions so far? Does anyone have any questions that I haven't addressed yet? Just out of curiosity, uh, when you, since you compiled uh, Erlang yourself, have you tried doing anything with uh, profile guided optimization for it? The question was, uh, since I compiled from source, have I done uh, profile guided optimizations? Um, I have not done that, but, uh, but I'd love to talk about it, because um, I don't really know what, I don't know what that is, but that sounds really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so yeah, I, I'd love to learn about that. Um, are there any other questions that, that uh, yeah? So what happened to all these uh, component matches that uh, you and uh, your work doing? Ted. Yeah, are they, have they made it upstream or? Um, I, I, I'm not sure, if, I'm not sure if, if they're going to be sent as PRs upstream. And the reason is uh, because it, it compromises um, the promise of the Erlang runtime to be available on systems that are not Linux. Um, specifically, uh, once, once this work is, is completed, um, it pretty much will only run on OS X, and it will only run on Linux. And it's only going to run at that you know, sort of best top-end speed. Um, and uh, there is there's absolutely zero appetite um, <laughs> within the organization to make, make those optimizations work on Windows as well. So. Um, as far as the OTP patches being available like on GitHub, yes, uh, they are available on the Basho fork of OTP 16 um, that's on GitHub. So, you know, if you want to take Basho's OTP and use it or benchmark it, have at. Um, it's really, really neat stuff, but, uh, oh, good. Um, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really good stuff. My, uh, my auto updater prompt just popped up, so uh, yeah, that's, that's why I said, oh, good. Um, all right, so uh, I wanted to talk about some of the resources and links. Uh, first of all, um, all of the raw data that I have for this talk is available at the very top link um, on GitHub. My GitHub ID is mrallen1, and the name of the repo is EF2016. Um, so if you're interested in the raw data, you can look at it there. Um, also, a copy of these slides are available there. The next one is Fling. We talked about Fling. If you're interested in that, um, evaluating that for your own use, um, feel free to ch check it out. It's Apache 2 licensed. Um, Basho Bench, fantastic tool, very easy to use. Uh, strongly recommend. You know, if you're looking for a benchmarking uh, framework or something, uh, seriously give some give Basho Bench some consideration. It's it's very easy to use. Um, the Leo project uh, fork of Shirley, really neat, um, very very good performance. Not quite as good as Etz, but if you need an LRU cache, that would be the one that I would pick. 
Um, the bottom one is E2QC, also very interesting, a little bit slower than Shirley, um, but also uh, pretty interesting. Uh, there's the VLD, uh, VLDB paper about uh, 2Q algorithm, I highly recommend. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention um, two years ago, also at Erlang Factory, uh, Jay Nelson uh, did a fantastic, awesome, amazing talk about ETS and concurrency patterns with ETS. So if you are in an environment that is extremely high performant and you want to store data or cache data in ETS, uh, Jay's talk delivers on a bunch of different strategies where you can minimize write and, lock, uh, write and read lock contention across uh, many readers, many writers. Uh, it's a great talk. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it is an hour of your time that you will, you know, uh, that will pay dividends many, many times. So um, it's a, a great talk. I highly recommend that you watch it. Um, that's pretty much what I have to show you today. Um, and I would love to answer any questions that anyone has. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.